If your best option to keep your beer cold is to dunk those bottles in the East River, then I find that sad, but also pretty cool. After all, Richard Widmark's character in this movie doesn't have electricity, so sometimes necessity breeds not only invention, but coolness. Well, if you drop your favorite drinks not into the river, but into your mug, then you need to pay close attention for the next 60 to 90 seconds. And that's because we have a sponsor, and they aren't a beer company, they're Spark Plug Coffee. They have the freshest, fairly traded, premium Arabica beans in this vast country we call Canada. They've got half-calf and full-on decaf for those who don't dig on stimulants. They've got plenty of blends and roasts, including rotating seasonal blends, in case you just don't want to keep drinking what you sipped back in the middle of winter. Canadians will get whatever they order within a week, and shipping will be free. Americans will also get what they want within a week, but they're going to have to pony up for those delivery costs. you got to do some ponying. But hey, it's worth it, and it's also worth it to be a member. That gets you perks and deals that some, I'll get some of your coffee, I don't know, sometimes, type of person just won't get, and you'll save money on every order. You can cancel or even just pause your classy membership if and when you need to. That's a huge reason this is not a rinky-dink coffee of the month club. We're agreed, right, that you're going to go to sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S, and we need to make you very aware that using that H-Y-E-S promo code will save you 20% off your very next order. All right, then, the review needs to start now, so let's get to it. (gasps) Action! Have you ever seen... Pickup on South Street. Hiya, movie fans, and thank you for lending a small part of your day to the 532nd cold beer drop of Have You Ever Seen. We go back a ways and review motion picture classics, and don't be sore that this classic, like all the rest we cover, will be spoiled. Just do not, please, be sore. Today it's just one voice you will hear. I'm the big thumb, Ryan Ellis, your solo host today. My wife, Bev, doesn't work Fridays, partly because she's actually working at the job that helps us keep this house. When I do these monologues, I go through the plot sequentially, I crack some whys, I deal in just a smidgen of tomfoolery, and I will no doubt attempt to do some impressions of movie characters. You might not like them, you might love them, I don't know. Let's set the table. Pick Up on South Street was released 70 years ago by 20th Century Fox on May 27th, 1953. Samuel Fuller's film made a nice little profit, and as I always do when we talk about a movie that William Fox's studio made, why in the name of criminy is this not on Disney Plus? Disney bought Fox, and they have some of their classics on that site, but not nearly all of them. Can I say The Hustler again, of course? And I think I raved about The Poseidon Adventure was there and then was not. And you're charging more now, Disney+, Plus, or at least you will soon. Robbery. Okay, Blaze of Glory, the movie's original title, which makes very little sense to me, Blaze of Glory, is aces with the Rotten Tomatoes crowd. The critics give it 93% with an average of 7.8 out of 10. There are 40 reviews on the site. The Rotten Tomatoes audiences are right in line with those critics. They give it 89%. The National Film Registry through this... <laughs> it always takes me what three t- takes to get through. National Film Registry. You don't know that, but I cut them up. Anyway, they threw this film into the Library of Congress in 2018, along with Broadcast News, Brokeback Mountain, Hood, Jurassic Park, My Fair Lady, and The Shining. We've chatted about all six of those motion pictures on this channel at one time or another. Pickup got one Oscar nomination. Thelma Ritter was up for Best Supporting Actress, one of six times she was in the running for that award, including four times in a row in the early 50s, but she never won. Pickup was a candidate for the American Film Institute's Top 100 Thrills, but didn't end up making that cut. I don't know if I quite would have put it on that list, but this guy's thrills. So what is Sam Fuller up to with this gritty little noir flick about communists and cops and robbers, oh my? Well, we open with the 20th Century Fox logo and a fairly typically loud 1950s musical fanfare by composer Lee Harline, or maybe it's Harlan, H-A-R-L-I-N-E. This is the guy who wrote the music for Snow White, then won two Oscars for the score and for When You Wish Upon a Star, so the original song, in Pinocchio. The first post credit shot of the flick, though, is our leading lady Candy, played with a lot of fire by Jean Peters as she's standing on a crowded New York subway. This movie called Pick Up on South Street stars a pickpocket, and he's Richard Whitmark as Skip McCoy. Skip's slick fingers manage to open Candy's purse without her noticing, and he makes her wallet his wallet. Since Candy is being tailed by government officials while all this is going on, they notice the robbery, but can't get to Skip before he gets off the train. And they're so curious about all this, not because they worry about whether or not Candy can buy groceries or pay her rent next month, it's because her wallet had a microfilm about secrets that were going to be sold to communists. We'll find out later, she did not know that. Remember how Richard Attenborough, so the old man, John Hammond, was always saying in Jurassic Park about how he spared no expense? 
including paying for Richard Kiley to be the voiceover guy that you hear in the trucks that go through the dino park? Well, here is Richard Kiley almost 40 years earlier as Joey, who tells Candy what she didn't know, that she was carrying that microphone and the snapshots are of some kind of formula. This was supposed to be the last thing she'd ever do for her now ex-boyfriend, but now she's got to find that pickpocket and if she gets the film back, Joey will never bother her again. Never! Never! I love that in the old taste of movie characters. Never! Never! I guess like a lot of modern people saying things twice all the time. The local cops and the FBI, well, the government agents, but this Zara guy is with the FBI, right? Well, they're trying to find a mugshot of Skip, since Zara and his partner could identify the face of the man they clearly saw on the subway, but otherwise have no leads. They call the local informant in, Mo Williams. This is Thelma Ritter. It's a ghoulish touch that I wish they didn't have to pay off the way they do, because I like Mo, and this is quietly one of the best performances Ritter ever gave. But I find it odd that she goes on and on about trying to make enough money to buy a nice funeral plot and stay out of a pauper's grave. Some people just don't have grand ambitions. They don't want to get rich or cure cancer or raise a big family. They just want to die well. I'm somewhere in between. Don't need to get rich. Dying well is not really enough for me either. Somewhere in between. Captain Tiger is played by Mervyn Vi, who worked a lot, but especially on television. Well, he's the one who's friendly with Mo, including knowing about this obsession with being buried in a nice place. But Miss Williams spends most of her time basically interrogating Zara. The actor playing him is Willis Bushy. The Bush was in The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance about 10 years later, a movie we covered in 2017. Anyway, Mo needs specifics about how the pickpocket held and used his newspaper when he pulled off the wallet lift. She claims different people steal differently. Very specific things as well. One guy uses a newspaper. Well, many guys do, I guess. But they use it differently in how they actually use the newspaper. But she knows Skip's moves and figures out it was him just by hearing about the specific way. He yanked that wallet out of that purse. She wants 50 bucks to name the cannon. They use that word a lot in this movie. I don't know if it's C-A-N-N-O-N or just C-A-N-O-N. Don't know that one from before. I, must have, I know that before. I've seen this movie many times. I love this movie. But anyway, cannon. I'm rambling. But she'll take 38.50 and she'll give them eight names as the possible pickpocket. And yeah, Skip, of course, is one of the eight. She's even willing to tell them where he's holed up for a little extra. And where he is holed up is in a shack right on the waterfront of New York's South River, a place that's meant to sell bait and tackle. When I told Bev I was going to cover this movie in this slot, she could not remember which one this was. She knew she'd seen it with me years ago, but just couldn't remember the plot. When I said it's the one where Widmark hides a basket of beer down in the water to keep it cold, then she knew exactly what I was talking about. It's a great device, one of my favorite touches in the entire film. And Fuller must have known how memorable it was because he has Widmark pull that basket up several times during this flick, although rarely to snag any beer. I think he has one once, maybe twice. See, Mr. McCoy has a waterproof bag stashed in a hidden section at the bottom of the basket where he keeps all his stealings. Oh, and there's the microphone, which means absolutely nothing to him. A couple of cops bring Skip in for questioning. He might fold under questioning. Tiger isn't a big fan of the light fingers man. The Tigers slugged Skip in the past and the snide McCoy dares him to do it again. But good cop Zara plays it reasonable and just wants the wallet. If the Skipster cooperates, then any charges against him will be dropped. But he's still so mad at Tiger for pinching him three times and making him a three-time loser, so no way is he willing to help them out. I thought that three-time loser thing was a recent thing during the Clinton administration. I think it was supposed to be if you committed any kind of three crimes, then you'd go up for life. And it didn't have to be all about murder or drugs either. Well, I guess it wasn't <laughs> during the Clinton administration, was it? I would have sworn that Woodmark used that phrase I've been throwing around a lot lately. Stinker. You're a stinker. And in this scene. But either he does and I somehow missed it. And I was awake. I was paying attention. Or he doesn't. And I'm thinking of some other movie. I thought Woodmark said that. He does ask if they're waving the flag in his face and has a pretty surprising response to being asked if he knows what treason is. Who cares? This guy is not a hero. What's surprising about it is even movie villains during the height of the Cold War didn't tend to be indifferent to communism. They were either for it, like in The Manchurian Candidate, or they could at least agree with their fellow Americans that it was, you know, bad. And Skip isn't even a villain, even though he did and does some pretty crappy things in this. This is far from the only noir that got deep into politics. Although that angle in this movie was changed to be about drug dealing when they dubbed it into other languages and countries that, I guess, couldn't handle the notion of espionage. I bet it was, well, then again, Cold War countries got movies back then, right? That's probably what it was, though. Yeah, I bet it was the Iron Curtain movies. We can't make communism seem bad, so change it up. I just talked about phrases people say in this flick, so this is a pretty good time for the nutshell. So, pick up on South Street in a nutshell. Don't be sore and don't be a commie. I think the words sore and commie or red are in this movie more than the words a ah or the. This isn't really a criticism, but Fuller just has his actors saying these things a lot. So the badges let him go. Stinking badges, you stinking badges. And Skip goes back to the shack to dewater the microfilm and put it in his pocket. Well, it wasn't wet, but he got out of the water. Anyway, that's a pretty reckless thing to do right after they hauled him in because he's got to know they're going to be following him now. 
Of course, he also knows they can't just throw him to the ground and search him for no reason, because he's not a black man in Rudy Giuliani's New York City. But they did tell him how important that film is, and maybe government officials talking about stuff like this might just say to hell with your constitutional rights, thieving man. No constitution for you, sir. But Skip wants to see what he's dealing with and goes straight to the library to put in one of those microfiche machines and seems to recognize that the formula he's looking at means something. Good for this small-time picker. I wouldn't. It would look like a gibberish math equation to me. But I'm not a character in a movie who has to quickly understand things he probably shouldn't understand. Vic Perry here has a great little scene with Gene Peters where he constantly eats, I guess, Chinese food, and reveals to her that he knows that Mo will know who the pickpocket is. Everyone knows that Mo knows. So the traitor to her country basically does the same thing the cops did. She goes straight to Mo. 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 And Mo is willing to point a finger Skip's way if Candy snaps off 50 bucks. Skip comes home in the dark. Did I say already he's got no electricity there by the water, hence no fridge for the beer? And he finds somebody rummaging through his stuff. He punches out what he then sees as Candy, only realizing it's her after she's laying on the ground. You might be able to get away with punching out a woman in a movie made today when the guy doing it doesn't know he's hitting a woman. But this was fairly common back in 1953. And to do it deliberately. Hell, villains hit women just because they felt like it back then. Think of the big heat. I think it was the same year as this movie, around the same time as this movie. Our hero here, or anti-hero, isn't supposed to be that kind of dude. Although Candy is working for the Reds. And again, he didn't know he was biffing a dame when he reared back his haymaker. Sometimes you gotta speak like the 50s spoke. Dame, haymaker. When <laughs> Stink it. When Candy comes to, Skip quickly figures out how she found him. She gave Mo 50 bucks. Not a bad day for a friendly neighborhood informer. She made close to 100 smackers just for wagging her gums and telling the same story to two different people. And of course, Skip figured out how Candy found him partly because he finds in her bag the kind of necktie that, I guess, only Mo sells? I guess her having a necktie in her purse is a bit of a giveaway when you know that Mo sells them. Hell, Zara had to pony up a buck earlier in the day for one of those just to get her to keep talking. Mo, that is. Then again, he could use the tie because he is a dude. Well, breaking news, he's a dude. And as so often happened in the noir era, a man ends up passionately kissing a woman he had smacked not three minutes earlier. It's actually a well-lit and sexually staged scene. It's weird how we're probably supposed to be turned on by this, even though he's a criminal and she's a traitor, or she's at the very least helping out a bunch of traitors. She's traitor adjacent. Tiger shows up after Skip kicks Candy out of his place and he finds the pickpocket just swinging in his hammock. That remains one of my favorite words, hammock. If Bev and I weren't broke, I would have bought one this year. It would have been nice to lay in one of those a few lazy afternoons when I was on vacation a few weeks ago. Tiger grudgingly offers to erase Skip's three-time loser status if he plays ball, but McCoy just will not help out his copley rival. It seems like getting cleared of his three-time loserdom would be more important to Skip than trying to get as much money out of the commies as he can, but no. Money, 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 money. Candy goes to see Joey again, who gives her 500 bucks this time. Five, zero, zero. She can keep whatever she doesn't offer Skip as a payoff. I love how Kylie plays Joey as desperate and even a little whiny in this scene. Skip is relaxing in a small boat beside the love shack when Candy comes back to see him. They get touchy-feely again, and man, he looks snazzy in his white dress shirt and brushed back hair. They have a crush on Dickie Wids. Them getting close leads to more passionate knocking. But after she tells him he'd get 500 clams if he'd just hand over the film, he gets mad again. He wants a lot more than that. He wants 25,000. Candy is back on the road and goes back to Joey yet again, although now he has a few friends over. JoJo's bosses are not whiny and nervous the way he was the last time we saw him. One of these two smoking men quietly demands that the film be delivered by tomorrow night. The other smoking man pulls out a gun, lays it on the desk, and says, Get that film! You stink it. Candy, who must be making the subway owners rich with all the money she's giving them today, goes back to see Mo. The old lady says she's not an informer, she just sells information. Which makes you an informer. Mo, you're splitting hairs here. Mo finds Skip smoking and drinking coffee in a cheap cafe. She tries to convince him that she didn't sell him out but they just managed to identify him immediately from the eight possible names she offered up. She also speaks up for Candy, saying that Joey's ex is in love with our man Skippy. We know from a previous scene that he didn't hold it against Mo for fingering him earlier in the day, but he's stiff-arming his old friend pretty hard here, considering he did tell Candy that he gets it, why she didn't keep her mouth shut. Mo's very profitable day ends with her death at the hands of Joey Jojo Shabadoo. Oh, Joey Jojo, come back! Well, first he offers her 500 bucks to name the pickpocket, I don't, by the way, know how she didn't know he was in the room when she walked in, although it's a cool shot when she's lounging in the bed and his feet come into the view beside her. I guess he was sitting in a chair beside the bed, although that makes it even more unlikely that she wouldn't have seen him. Cool shot, though. Ritter has a pretty great speech about why she is who she is, and she refuses to take a dirty commie's money. I just don't like them. Now that Joey knows that Moe knows far too much about him, he does her the favor she's asking him to do, partly because she's so tired, and blows her head off. 
The cops bust into Skip's shack later that night and accuse him of killing Mo, who's going to Potter's Field. No fancy funeral after all. Although Skip, who's been let go and is no longer a murder suspect, and I didn't really get why, boats out to the barge to stop them from taking Mo's remains to an unmarked grave. He takes her wet, stained coffin back with him. I don't, by the way, mean he should have been a suspect in her murder. We know he didn't do it. I just mean that they thought he could have done it. Then they just let him go. Did I space out and miss something? Maybe. I've been known to do that. And since this shack on the South River is never empty, Skip comes back and finds Candy laying in his hammock. Oh, the hammock. She confesses that she tried to talk sense to Mo, and she's very upset that this woman she knew for about five minutes in total is now dead because of, well, her. Skip gets Joey's address out of her, then pulls up his beer basket right in front of her. Out comes the film, then out go his lights when she whacks him over the head. And I thought he was smart. You let her see you grab the film she's been desperate to find right in front of her? Dude, she's working for the enemy, and you knew this. Candy takes the film directly to Tiger and Zara, although Zara wants her to go to Joey and take the film right to him instead. Because as much as they want that film, what they really want are the men who want the film. Candy casually takes a bath while waiting for Joey to stop by. She really ought to realize he's going to try to kill her. So does she just want to die clean? I shower every day, sometimes twice a day, but even I realize when soaping up needs to take a back seat to more important things. Not often, though. Very rarely. I don't have anything really that important going on in my life. Not like this. <laughs> Breaking news. I don't have espionage and murder and $500 payoffs in my future, my past, my present. If we were bothered by Skip slugging Candy earlier, well, this is much worse. She gives Joey the film, but he instantly realizes that a frame is missing. So he shoves her into the wall, smacks her around, then just shoots her in the back when she tries to bolt. And it looks like Jean Peters did all this. I don't think it was a stunt woman, so kudos to her to make it look so believable. It isn't a long punch-up, that'll happen a little later, but it's not subtle either. She sells very well that he's pulverizing her. At least the Joe man didn't actually manage to kill her. The coppers come in to find her down, but still alive. So this doofus can't even kill somebody, right? Maybe they should have spared an expense and found somebody other than Richard Kiley. And even though he almost pulled off an escape without being noticed, the fuzz do find the coward hiding in the dumbwaiter. Joey manages to overpower a cop down in the street when he comes out of the dumbwaiter, the dumb guy, dumbwaiter, and socks him hard a few times, which, I guess, killed him? If this character was supposed to be Gibbs, then yeah, Zara does tell somebody on the phone that Gibbs didn't make it. And now every man on the force has been mobilized, because you kill a cop, and now we're really passionate. Kill the average person, maybe we'll solve it. Candy gets her very own bed in the hospital, and her face is bruised in several places, which we and Skip see when he comes to see her. Wait, she was shot in the back and laying on her back. That's gotta be painful. They kiss again after Candy says she took this beating because she wouldn't tell Joey where Skip lived. Backing him up all the way. True love. Although Joey did find out where the oft-visited shack is located, and he shows up with one of those menacing guys who scared the pants off Joey earlier that night. So she kept her mouth shut for nothing. Skip had been hiding under his shack, and here's what they said, then sneaks away and follows Joey, appropriately, on the subway. That's where all this mess started, the subway. Joey doesn't know what Skip looks like, so the pickpocket is able to go right up to him with a newspaper to hide his tricky fingers and steal away Joseph's gun. Now, I know pickpockets are brilliant at being able to get things from people without it being noticed, but you don't feel the weight of a gun being pulled out of its holster right beside your chest? Oh wait, Joey's a dummy. I keep forgetting that. Joey tries to make the exchange with one of the commies in the subway's washroom, which is when Skip pipes up and says, There's a frame missing, buster. Why didn't he call him a stinker? Come on, call him a stinker. A brawl breaks out and Skip to my Lou goes after Joe Dirt. They slug it out on the 3rd Street subway platform, and it gets ugly. Apart from the fact that, like so many movie characters, Skip can punch a guy repeatedly without hurting his hand, this feels like a more honest depiction of a fight than most movies show us. It's interesting that Fuller doesn't even show the end of the scrap, though. The scene dissolves to the next one while Skip is biffing Joey right in the schnub down in the subway tracks. And the good guys win! Or at least the man whose thieving was responsible for all this tomfoolery today is part of the group of people who win. Old Skip. Not a stinker. In the coda, Skip gets his release papers from Captain Tiger, wiping out his three-time loser status. Tiger is still sore that Skip didn't fry for being a two-bit purse snatcher, and he's probably right that the real McCoy won't be able to stay out of jail for very long. But Candy, who's there at the cop shop too with a face that's magically back to 100%, sneers, want a bet, at the captain. So this woman who is dating Joey, a man who sided with communists and therefore probably shouldn't be allowed to just roam free, is going to keep this thief on the straight and narrow? This ending is cool, but it might be a bigger fantasy than what's in Star Wars. Although maybe what Fuller doesn't show us is the Ocean's Eleven ending. Yes, they walk off together, but they'd be tailed for a good long while. So don't screw up, you two lovebirds. So the cast. Richard Widmark made his film debut in Kiss of Death, where he played an insane villain. That got him his only Oscar nomination, 
although the guy who spent most of his career as a leading man was up for Best Supporting Actor. 1950 was a particularly big year for the Wids. He was in Night in the City, Panic in the Streets, and No Way Out. He was also part of the ensemble cast for Murder on the Orient Express, Sidney Lumet's 1974 star-studded take on the Agatha Christie classic. Widmark's one of those actors who might have been forgotten by casual filmgoers, or was never known at all, but he should certainly be remembered by anyone who cares about this business. He's one of my low-key favorites, and I really should have covered one of his projects long before now. I'm the stinker. Gene Peters was in pretty big titles like Viva Zapata, Niagara, and Three Coins in the Fountain, but we hadn't covered those or any of our other pictures before now. Marilyn Monroe was a Fox employee at the time and did read for Candy, but Fuller thought she was way too hot. Apparently Betty Grable had a shot at the role too, and there are all kinds of explanations about why she didn't play the part, but I think the best reason is just that Fuller wanted Peters more. She and Woodmark do some pretty good smoldering together, and she knew how to play a woman getting thrown around in her own apartment. Unless that was a stunt woman, if it was, she looked just like Jean Peters. Thelma Ritter was not in many films, but we've now covered four of them. The three previous ones were Miracle on 34th Street, where she's a very small role, then she was awesomely caustic in All About Eve, and was Jimmy Stewart's masseuse in Rear Window, my personal favorite Hitchcock flick. My favorite Flitchcock. And I talked about the other guys, I think, during the body of this. So let's skip ahead to their director, Samuel Fuller, who wrote and directed a veritable plethora of gritty films, including The Steel Helmet, Shock Corridor, and The Big Red One. That's a pretty popular war film with a lot of people. It came out in 1980, I believe, so around the end of his career. May have been his last film. If you're not familiar with this man, seek out some of his work. I did a check on YouTube last night, and about a half dozen of his films are free on there, including Hell and High Water, Hell and High Water, not the one from a couple years ago, which is Hell or High Water, Park Row, and this, Pick Up on South Street. Although I watched my Criterion DVD for this, not what's on YouTube. I'd say Fuller is a lower-budget version of John Sturgis, meaning a director who didn't linger in people's minds like the famous ones did, but somebody who made several really good films, and has probably been forgotten by the average person. Fuller wrote this, along with Dwight Taylor, who actually only got story credit, Fuller went the John Huston route in his career and wrote plenty of scripts before he ever got a chance to direct one. As for details, he had a hand in other noir flicks, but also worked on musicals like Top Hat back in the 30s. As for the cinematographer, Joseph McDonald did a great job shooting this black and white picture. He was nominated three times in his career, but not for this, and I would have been fully behind the idea of his work here getting that kind of recognition. I mentioned that Woodmark was in Panic in the Streets. Well, Joe shot that too. His long list of credits also includes one of John Ford's more underrated titles, My Darling Clementine, the Wyatt Earp story from the John Ford point of view. I like this movie a lot. It's snappy, it's clever, it doesn't linger for two hours and give us a lot of unnecessary bloat. In fact, the picture is only about an hour and 20 minutes, and it's about something. I don't think film noir needs to make statements or stand for anything. A crime story is a crime story. Fuller, though, often got into movies that were about something. He just had a pulpy style that didn't make it seem like he was preaching a message at you. That's similar to the way Tarantino put all of Jules's talk in Pulp Fiction about religion, God, and spirituality into an otherwise very non-messagey flick. I believe I said in our Pulp Fiction review that it's a surprisingly spiritual or even religious movie, considering the violence, the drugs, and the bad language. But as for the political angle in Pick Up on South Street, it also just goes to show how stupid modern rhetoric is. To call Democratic presidents communists the way some people always do just proves they don't know what they're talking about. What a surprise, doesn't know what he's talking about. You can criticize Clinton, Obama, and Biden for a lot of reasons, but they did or have done little to change the capitalist system in America. Plus, a communist you need to worry about is not someone who wants workers of the world to unite. It's the kind of person who will sell national secrets to their country's sworn enemy at the height of a Cold War. Like the guy I was just referencing, obliquely, not so obliquely, you know what I'm talking about. I'm getting political. I'm usually the one with, let's say, complicated feelings about America and the things their leaders have done. But trying to keep a microfilm that shows important scientific findings from getting into the wrong hands is something... I have to support. And what's interesting is that it's not like Skip McCoy ever really changes his ways. He was willing to take money from Joey and his scary buddies even after he knew exactly what they were all about. He just wanted more. It was the women with the morals, Mo, who just didn't like commies, and Candy, who paid for her sins with the beating she took from Joey, although maybe she shouldn't have got off quite so scot-free, but she suffered. We saw it. So yeah, very big thumbs up for one of my favorite flicks of 1953. Sam Fuller. Check him out. Look out for Shock Corridor and Underworld USA in particular. Oh, I decided to watch Shock Corridor on YouTube the night I finished up writing this monologue and then added this little bit right now. It's the Criterion print and it's pretty good. The movie gets a little hysterical and bizarre, but the actors are committed. Very committed. It's an interesting cousin to One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Oh, and one last thing about influence. I mentioned Tarantino a minute ago. I read that Jacob Fuller, the Keitel character in From Dusk Till Dawn, was named for the director of Pick Up on South Street and other strong titles in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So nice homage there, Quentin. And that was Pick Up on South Street. 
The next time you hear me rambling on by myself will be on Labor Day. Bev will be taking another holiday Monday off, as she has all summer. And it is still the summer until, what, the 21st, I guess, of September? Look at me knowing dates and stuff. Since it is Labor Day, I thought I'd find a bit of a weird way to talk about the working man. Robin Williams has four different jobs in Mrs. Doubtfire, and the film has the kind of bona fides I like to discuss. Plus, it's funny and has a lot of heart. And Bev can't stand it, so it makes sense for me to watch it alone. Another 1993 motion picture that will go up on this channel this year, and that will be on September 4th, Labor Day, Mrs. Doubtfire. Dude looks like a lady. But before we get to that one, on August 28th, Bev and I will be looking at a spooky, atmospheric classic about a vicious stalker and a couple of desperate kids, The Night of the Hunter. Robert Mitchum, pretty awesome in that film. I name-dropped YouTube a minute ago. Well, our shows are on there. Ever since the start of 2023, we've been posting our podcasts in full. Sometimes we provide bonus content. Well, we did that back in the winter, mostly. Always. But we never did get back to that this summer like we hoped to. Life competed. Anyway, find us by typing Have You Ever Seen into the right spot on the tube or by going to at H-Y-E-S Ellis in your browser. You can contact us either by Twitter or email. On the Twittage, I'm at MovieFiend51 and Bev is at Bev Ellis Ellis. While the email is Have You Ever Seen Podcast at Gmail dot com. And I remind you again that our glorious sponsor is Spark Plug Coffee. Glorious! They offer a 20% discount to customers who fire that H-Y-E-S promo code into the right box. Okay, that, as they say, is that. Thanks for your attention. I don't know about you, but I'm going to spend the weekend thinking about microfilm and cold beer in a shack down by the river. And cut.